and he walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. Sports. It once was used for unification of national pride, teamwork, and embodied citizenship, believing that anything was possible by working together toward a common goal. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Through coaches, teammates, parents, and prayer. And it was pure, not political, and certainly not poisoned. But unfortunately, somewhere at some point, and they've gotten to him, the ball is out. That philosophy was fumbled. First openly transgender athlete to win a Division I NCAA championship. President Biden's first executive orders was to allow transgender athletes to participate in girls' sports. Dominating the competition at the girls' track and field championship. The reason that we're here is to validate people like you. Beating out Olympians, beating out American record holders, the most impressive female swimmers this country has ever seen by body length. That you're biologically male. That was madness to me. It effectively eviscerates women's sports. And he's been refusing to stand for the national anthem. He's been wearing socks with a cartoon image of a pig in a police officer's cap. Folks, we lost our way. Mocking the Catholic faith and Catholic nun. Several players refused to don pride uniforms, which quickly spiraled into controversy. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. And there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And the time is now to gather the team that will bring this country back. I don't want you to know me by an NFL player. I want you to know me as a man that never gave up. Former NFL star himself, Jack Brewer. In America, we are a team. And always remember that we are God's communal man. By now, you've seen this picture almost everywhere. It represents unity. You've seen people of different stripes, colors, coming together, praying. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him coming together in prayer. And that's what makes us the true champions. This is storybook! This is almost fate! See, there's a whole life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. We are literally in the spiritual battle of our lifetime. We need to instill hope again to fight for the American dream. And we need to put American first principles back in the playbook. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. He's done it! You thought we were going to be able to talk about sports, didn't you? Throwing the ball. No, nah, we passed that, baby. We trying to save so much. Everyone, this is Brooke Rollins, uh, president and CEO of the America First Policy Institute. And today we have the most amazing announcement. Um, listen, one of the greatest blessings uh, of the last three and a half years in building the America First Policy Institute and ensuring that the uh, infrastructure for the America First agenda stays alive after the last administration um, with President Trump, hopefully through the next administration, but really on into the next 100 or 250 years for this country. And in so doing, uh, putting in place the greatest warriors, uh, the most impressive patriots, uh, the most incredible Americans that are on the field today both uh, literally and figuratively. And today I'm joined by one of the very greatest, even at an extremely young age. Uh, Riley Gaines has proven that anything is possible. Um, certainly she proved that when she was a swimmer for Kentucky, uh, five-time SEC champion, SEC record holder. And for all the SEC lovers in the house, that's uh, that's super, super cool. Uh, but perhaps her latest um, adventure is even more important. And that is what we're going to talk about today is, again, we make this great announcement that the incredible Riley Gaines is joining the America First Policy Institute officially. She's always been part of the family uh, a bit informally, but today we're so excited to announce she's coming on board as the vice chair of our Athletes for America. So Riley, welcome to the family officially. And uh, we just couldn't be more thrilled to have you. Well, Brooke, thank you. Uh, oh my goodness, that was just the kindest introduction. Um, but as you said, we have been informally affiliated with each other. I mean, really since the beginning of, of at least uh, taking that, that initial leap of faith for me personally. Uh, you guys have been there for me. You have provided resources and support and encouragement uh, consistently 
Uh, and so to now officially be a part of the team uh, is super exciting. The team that you guys have, of course, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, and so to be a part of that, I'm, I'm just honored. I'm humbled, really. Well, that honestly, the honor is ours. And, um, and you've just sort of blown me away from even the first time we've met, uh, especially really your, your world turned upside down. Uh, and, and I think everybody knows your story. I mean, uh, one of the things that I love the most is that, you know, I have four teenagers, 14, 16, 18, and 19, and um, they perhaps know your name above almost everyone else's name in the the work that we are in, which is Saving America. That's our job at AFPI and, and with our friends. But just quickly, um, I'm sure for you, the one millionth time, um, just give us a little bit of kind of your story and uh, and how you ended up as, frankly, one of the most well-known most sought after, most impressive uh, young women in America and around the world fighting for what's true and what's right? Well, uh, as you said, I was an athlete. I grew up an athlete, started competing, training when I was four years old, graduated when I was 22. So, I mean, I dedicated 18 years of my life to my sport, uh, which my sport was the sport of swimming. Uh, I went to University of Kentucky where I, I continued my athletic and academic career accomplished some, some really great things uh, that I will forever be proud of. But in my senior year, uh, we were forced to compete against a man. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a man who swam three years previously uh, on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team, where competing in his rightful category, the men's division, he ranked in the 400s and 500s nationally uh, to when switching to the women's division, he would go on to win a national title indicating that he was the fastest woman, of course, in air quotes in the entire nation. Uh, I mean, I, I, I saw the harm that was done. I, I mean, I, I really, I felt the injustice of having a man in the pool with us changing in the locker room with us, the silencing yeah. that we faced. Uh, he and I competed against each other in the 200 free, which almost impossibly enough resulted in a tie uh, but what yeah. really thrusted me over the edge into no longer being willing to to wait, to wait for someone else to say something, which is admittedly what I was doing, was after we had tied, uh, we go behind the awards podium where, you know, typically you're marched out, you're named All-American, you're given your trophy, you're, you pose for the photos. And we go back there and the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself, I guess, I, of course, him towering over me at six foot four. Yeah. And this official says, great job, you two, but you tied. And we only have one trophy and we're going to give the trophy to Leah because we've been advised that that's what, what is necessary when photos are being taken. Wow. And so, as I said, that that's just when I was no longer, um, I mean, I felt guilty in that moment is how I felt. Truly, I felt responsible for even participating in the farce. Yeah. I knew I couldn't go back home, look myself in the mirror Um knowing that one day I could have a daughter of my, of my own, you know, I have a younger sister. Uh, mm -hmm. No way I, I could continue uh, sitting idly by and doing nothing like all of those adults in the room uh, who were supposed to be protecting us uh, like they were doing. Yeah, it really is an amazing story. You know, one of the incredible honors of uh, me getting to work at AFPI and now you joining the team is working with people like Coach Lou Holtz, um, former NFL athletes like Jack Brewer and our Frank Murphy, who we both love so much, and Scott Turner. And, and now I think we have almost four dozen, you know, close to 50 uh, former professional athletes and, and athletes like you, Riley, that were top of your sport, who have signed on to this project. And the concept and the vision is that this has never been about Republicans or Democrats or partisan or whatever. This is about saving America. And and using in your project, using sports and, and working within the culture to educate um, real Americans who perhaps are struggling or perhaps, you know, don't have a bright vision for their kids future. But and they're not certainly watching Fox News or MSNBC or reading The Wall Street Journal, but they elevate sports in their community. And so the responsibility, I think, for you and for our athletes in terms of ensuring that all Americans understand what's at stake and why America is the greatest country in the history of the world and why the American dream 
is here where it is nowhere else, frankly, in the world or in the history of, of our, um, of the world. But the opportunity to work with people like Coach Holtz and Frank and Jack to ensure that we're preserving, you know, for our children, our children's children, uh, this country. Uh, think, let's talk about that for a little bit. I mean, Coach Holtz is one of a kind, clearly the guys and, and bringing on lots of other women like you, but you being part of that leadership team as we build that out. Well, the people you mentioned, uh, the people that I have gotten to to know and respect and admire and and truly love over these past two years or so. Yeah. I mean, of course, they're legends. They're legends in their own respective right on the field, uh, whatever, you know, the, the scenario or situation may be. But far more admirable um, about these people, Frank Murphy, Jack Brewer, Coach Lou Holtz, yeah. people you mentioned, what is far more admirable about them is their hearts, yeah, um, their willingness to do what is right, even though it yeah. might not be popular, even though it, it might uh, warrant backlash or, or criticism or what have you. They still understand it to be what is true, what is fair, what is just, what is moral. Um, and so these are people that, um, I mean, to even be in the same boat with these people, Again, mm. people I've looked up to for for a long time before this this movement ever even affected me. But to mm. now understand them, to know them, uh, it's really really special. Uh, I, I think what yeah. these people embody, being athletes, I, I think it uniquely prepares you to be able to to fight this fight. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think of my own personal experience being on a team, playing sports in general. I mean, it taught me how to be a leader. It taught me how to be. I mean, how to persevere, how to be resilient, how to be dedicated, how to set goals and, and work to achieve those goals. And of course, all of these skill sets are, are things that we are utilizing and we do so pretty effectively given our background with AFPI and with the Athletes for America Coalition. You know, I love that answer, Riley. And I will say I was in the last White House uh, for three years and so many members of our team there now are at AFPI, but starting there and so many of the very best of our team in the last White House were former college athletes. Uh, you know, Alex Campana, who I know you know, is on our team. She was a, a runner at Pepperdine. Uh, Ryan McEnany uh, was a hurdler at Florida. Um, Sam Mims, I'm not sure you've met Sam yet. Sam was a volleyball player and she and amazingly enough, was the only D1 athlete in the country who was both student body president and a volleyball player. Uh, and then I had so many more, both in the last White House and currently at AFPI. And I found that to be very, very true. I, um, I continue to be impressed with um, really the whole team, but those who have that background in sports, and I know your family is sort of insane, right? Your mom was a college softball player. Your dad was a college football player and then played in the NFL. Your dad's many brothers were all college football players and played in the NFL. Your sister is a college softball player. Your brother, also an, a, a college football player, I believe. Your little sister now looks like she's taking um, the gymnastics world by storm. I mean, this is remarkable, but knowing you so well, obviously DNA and being athletic, you know, from birth probably helps, um, which I did not get that, unfortunately. But uh, there's got to be more to it than just being born with the right genes and, and the work and the dedication and the goal setting and just the diligence to stick with it. Um, even, you know, when it looks like maybe there's a big uphill climb, I I'm sure and I've heard you talk about this was was in incredibly instructive in your life. But now so I'd love to talk to you just a second about that. But how you now tie that same hustle and intentionality to the current battlefield, right? Which is saving the country and specifically within your policy lane, protecting women and uh, and fighting for women, whether it's in the sports arena or in other areas of life too. To address your, your first point very briefly about kind of the excellence that athletes yeah. bring to the table. I saw a, a recent Ernst & Young study that said 94% of C-level executives uh, that our females were female athletes. And so to wow. just kind of provide some data to that to that yeah. point you made, uh, I thought that was really interesting. And it, and it goes to show uh, why playing sports is really is, is foundational, uh, yeah. far beyond just your athletic success. Um, 
But what I believe, it's easy to look at a lot of the things going on around the country, a lot of the the cultural chaos that that never takes a day off, that that's really plaguing this country. It's easy to look at all of that and have a negative outlook, to to feel hopeless, to think I'm just one person, I can't do anything about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I realize that is, of course, uh, not the the outlook to have because that's not the truth. I think about what sets me apart, maybe from from some of my my peers who um, in the same situation of competing against this boy, changing in the locker room with this boy, having our voices effectively muzzled. Uh, I, I think about what set me apart, even though they knew it was wrong. They felt the same yeah. way I did. Why was I the one to to take that stand? Uh, I do have wonderful parents. I credit so much of my success and, and the ability to think for myself and, and the ability to, I mean, to lead. I, I credit a lot of that to my parents and how they raised me, uh, which brings me to my second point, because they raised me in the church. Uh, yeah. So my faith, uh, that is instrumental in my life before anything. Yeah. I want to live a Christ-like life. Um, that's what gives me the hope. That's yeah. what gives me the reassurance because I'm under. I understand that that we're fighting a a a, a war, of course, but I guess more so we're fighting a, in a battle. But the war has has already effectively been won. Amen. And knowing that, um, it's all it's it allows me to do what I do with a smile on my face and and honestly an incredibly light heart. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's what makes I- me unique, and I, I think uniquely equips me to be able to fight the fight. Yeah, it's funny. I, um, You and I have talked about this, but I saw a light in you when we first met four years ago at the first AFPI event when right after we launched and you came and I don't think you really knew much about us and we didn't really know much about us either. We just knew that ultimately we had to do something. And, uh, and I saw that light and I always tell my four kiddos, you know, when they're off to school or off to whatever, always let your light shine. And um, you can just see that in you, Riley. It's it's impressive. But one of the most impressive things I've ever seen from anyone is you and I last summer were in Milwaukee at the RNC. And I invited you to come to one of our prayer breakfasts. And you were so gracious to agree. And as we are walking into the prayer breakfast, I lean over to you and I say, hey, would you want to say a few words? And I think for most um, young men and women, uh, this was a room full of extremely you know, successful uh, men and women in business, in elected office, in whatever. And without hesitation, you said yes. And I thought, well, this is going to be really great. I kind of expected you just to stand up and say, keep fighting. And instead, you stood up. And this is ultimately an incredible tribute to you, but also um, to your parents. You stood up. And in seven minutes, you completely blew the room away. You were quoting scripture you were tying that scripture back to uh, the battle that we're in right now, which is, you know, light versus darkness. And you did it in a way that was extremely compelling, but also very approachable. And I think that's why I think that's why you're such a game changer. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that, but we're going to wrap up. This is sort of the last thing. And, and I thought of you. Um, this is a really amazing book that Alveda King, one of our other sisters uh, in Christ, gave me. It's Daily Prayers for Women. And I was reading this uh, this morning, and this is uh, day 39. Um, She just gave this to me a little bit ago. A prayer about the will of God. Um, The question is, when I want to know what God's will is for my life. And the scripture is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. But but here's the great part. This is what I kind of want to conclude on and let you sort of wrap up the work we're doing. Um, the prayer is Heavenly Father, I want to follow your will for my life, but sometimes it seems so vague and difficult to know what that is. I wish you would give a clear sign to show me the way. So I read this and in all due respect, I kind of laughed out loud because I almost feel like it's exactly the opposite for me. Like God has been, and it is a blessing, but so clear to me um, what the path is. Now it's taken different turns and, you know, had some some pivots along the way that I didn't expect. But um, I, I find that to be such an incredible gift to know clearly in my heart um, what that calling is, it's to be a mom and a wife first, and then to work to save America second. And I have a feeling this may um, be similar to you, that you sort of have had this calling. 
And, uh, and now we're running into the arena as fast as you can, which for you is fast and running toward the fire, uh, as fast as you can, realizing that there's a more comfortable life out there if you choose something different. But, but this is what we're called to do. So why don't you take us out with some thoughts on that? And again, what a joy to have you on the team. No doubt. Uh, no doubt about it. I, I, I mean, truthfully, and, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit this, but for a while I wanted to ignore that calling because I thought to myself, you know, I'm really not qualified to talk on this or, or to have this platform that I have. You know, I don't understand our, our government. I knew we had three yeah. branches. I don't know what they do. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I never had to learn what they do. I don't even mm -hmm. think they know what they do, to be totally <laughs> honest with you. It's fair. I, public speaking in college, you know, my face would, would turn the color of a tomato. And so, I wow. mean, by no means that I feel prepared for this. And I naively believe that's how God worked. I believed... Mm he called those who were already prepared. Um, but that is not what he yeah. does. Uh, actually, quite the contrary. He prepares those who he calls. Yeah. Uh, and if he brings you to it, he will certainly bring you through it. Just like he did with Moses, who led yeah. the Israelites out with Aaron and his staff. And just like he did with, with Joshua, who he promised a victory over the Canaanites. And just like he did with Esther before she was brought before the yeah. king. And yeah. so now it is very clear to me. It's, it's very, very clear uh, God's calling, how he has, uh, how he has been the lamp to, to my feet and a light into my path. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it's clear for both you and I, Brooke, because, uh, Satan, we know Satan, uh, for those who, who don't know Satan, it, it is vague, right? It, it might be harder to hear, but we see how Satan deceives. We see how he discourages and we see how he destroys. And when you see that, you see the hand of God just as clearly. I see how he provides me with strength and he provides me with, with wisdom and guidance and protection. Uh, all of those things are, are easy to see when you know the enemy, which is why, uh, again, I mean, all of these issues, again, I, I mentioned kind of the cultural chaos that we face. Uh, it can all be boiled down to, I mean, it's, it's a spiritual battle. As you said, it is, you know, we are, Paul tells us we'll reach a point where bitter is seen as sweet and light is or dark is seen as light and evil is seen as moral. And yeah. it's undeniable that that's not where we're at as a society now, which is why I'm thrilled uh, to be with now officially uh, America's first policy institute, uh, yeah. who is doing the the pivotal on the ground work and ensuring, um, I mean, putting policies in place that, that do make America great. Uh, mm. It's Amen. a wonderful thing to be a part of. And, and I couldn't be more grateful for you guys. Well, that was as well said as I've ever heard it said, and I mean that sincerely. So God bless you, Riley Gaines. Uh, God continue to bless the America First Policy Institute, and most importantly, God bless America. So thank you.